Good morning to all of you who are joining us today. I'm Dr. Hasafa Rangel, and I am thrilled to uh, offer this dialogue entitled The Doctor, the Yogi, the Meditation Teacher, Ancient Wisdom, Informing Medicine in the Time of Pandemic. We um, will be having a short Q&A at the end of our hour long conversation. You can post your questions in the uh, Q&A box at the bottom. I'll look at those at the very end. Please make sure you're muted. And um, I'd like to introduce my esteemed uh, colleagues and speakers today. Ken Carroll is an American teacher and author who leads courses in deep self-healing and embodied spiritual practice. His work is informed by years of in-depth study of yoga, qigong, Taoism, and classical Chinese medicine. Kane began his formal training at age the guidance of yogis and master teachers in Tibet, Nepal, Ecuador, and Colombia. He is author of the books Partner Yoga, Mudras of India, and Four Dignities. Thanks for joining us, Kane. It's a pleasure to be here. Jack Kornfield is a Buddhist monk in the monasteries of Thailand, India, and Burma. He has taught meditation internationally since 1974 and one, is a, one of the key teachers to introduce Buddhist mindfulness practice to the West. Jack co-founded the Insight Meditation Center in Barr, Massachusetts with fellow meditation teachers Sharon Salzberg and Joseph Goldstein and the Spirit Rock Center in Woodacre, California. Jack's books have been translated into 20 languages and sold more than a million copies. Titles such as A Path with Heart, After Ecstasy, The Laundry, and his most recent book, No Time Like the Present, Finding Freedom, Love, and Joy, Right Where You Are. I am a Stanford-educated medical doctor. I trained in internal medicine at UCSF and have done fellowships at the CDC and the Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine. In 2014, I began practicing a new medical paradigm I call innate medicine, in which I guide patients back to themselves, to the wisdom of their bodies and to their own deep knowing. I do not shun conventional medicine, but I reorient my patients to an ancient paradigm of wholeness and innate healing. My practice of medicine has been deeply informed by spiritual traditions. Such concepts of interconnectedness and impermanence allowed me to find meaning in medicine, which had become very mechanistic in its views of disease and illness. When I met Kane several years ago, my own deep knowing of the body's innate healing capacity was expanded by his master knowledge of ancient self-healing wisdom systems that have deeply informed my own medical practice and allowed many of my patients who were not responding to conventional or alternative treatment modalities to activate their own deep inner healing. So in this great challenging time of pandemic, I wondered how a yogi and a beloved meditation teacher might inform medicine from their own wisdom traditions. With my own primary care patients, I offer to them guidance in the preventative standard care and also in supportive care were they to become ill. But I've also been a champion of this concept of innate resilience. Innate is of itself, self-arising. Resilience is our life force itself. And this is a concept that is, that is missing within contemporary medicine. It's not something that we obtain from the outside. It's something that we cultivate from the inside. And the closest thing we have in medicine to this concept is something we call protective host factors. When we look at infectious disease, we look at the pathogen, the host factors, and the environmental factors that all play into the transmissibility of the infection to the severity of the illness. And what I find very interesting is that so much emphasis has been placed on pathogen um, 
And we know the disease spectrum of COVID-19 is diverse. There's asymptomatic to mild infection, which is the vast majority of patients. And then there is severity of infection, including needing life support and, and a significant fatality rate, but it's the minority. And although this concept of, of being asymptomatic and shedding viruses poses great challenges to the public health in terms of transmissibility, it's actually also great news in that this same virulent pathogen that can produce severe disease can also produce incredibly mild disease. And it's, it's about the host, the host's resilience. And I want to really give attention in this call to, to that concept. Um, and while I wait for the epidemiologic studies to, to lay out what are the protective host factors, innate resilience isn't something that lends itself to be fragmented and quantitated. Rather, instead of measuring it, it's something that we can cultivate. And so as a medical practitioner, I lean on the wisdom traditions to inform us of, of how and what is innate resilience. So Jack, can you tell us from a meditation perspective how you understand the concept of innate resilience? Well, it, uh, it feels deeply connected to what in the Buddhist tradition is called true nature or Buddha nature. And in those teachings, um, and more than in the teachings, in what can be described as our human life, our human lot, um, we are born with the, the Buddhist text begin, oh, nobly born, remember who you really are. Remember that you're the sons and daughters of the lineage of awakened ones. Um, this is your birthright. So we're born with the capacity um, inwardly um, to meet this world with compassion, with understanding, with wisdom, and with a wholeness that... Um, connects us with all things. Um, so you might say that's a direct parallel with the description you have of innate medicine. Thank you. And part of, I'll just say one more thing. Part of the work in um, fostering a healthy inner life, it's a kind of interesting thing because there's this, there's this um, tension there's a very strong developmental model in spiritual practice that you do this and you do that practice and you develop your, you know, your actions and right speech and right livelihood and you develop your ability to concentrate and you develop these physical capacities and then you start to develop your wisdom and you understand this and this and finally at some point when you've moved to the Himalayas and, you know, found the right yogi, you get enlightened or something. But there's a very big progress a model in spirituality out there. There's a whole other way of understanding it, which is that first model being closer to modern medicine, if you will. How do we cure the disease step at a time? And that is to say, you're already whole. You already contain within you all the things you need to live in this world with graciousness and compassion and an inner freedom. Thank you. Kane, would you like to add anything to, to this concept of innate resilience? Yeah, that last part that Jack spoke to, that view of intrinsic wholeness is something that's shared in, in Taoist traditions and in um, Indian yogic traditions in terms of the physical aspect of the cultivation of innate resilience, the sense of that, that life force, prana in, in Indian traditions, chi and Chinese traditions, that's always intact and always 100% um, vibrant and is animating from within us all of our tissues and organs and nerves and blood. And so the practice begins with that sense of respecting that wholeness as, as the very nature of the body, of what animates the body, and um, invites us to be sensitive to how each of us um, experience that through our physical existence and then to begin to cultivate that. But it's not seen as something that we don't 
have that we then have to do 20 years of standing meditation and you know all kinds of complex asanas and breathing exercises to somehow acquire it the sense is that it's always there shining like an ever bright sun in us radiating within us and we just have to attend to it through our self-care and that resilience will flourish of itself um, and in essence that's really the the background thinking behind practicing qigong forms or tai chi forms or yoga postures or breathing exercises and why traditionally each person uniquely explored those practices um, as they pertained to their age their phase of life their constitution um, and there was no real standard that everybody was encouraged to follow exactly the same as another person but it was individualized according to even their their environment and where they lived um, in the times so um, yeah I think that 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 idea if we can apply that idea to our physical exercise practices um, it gives us access to that resilience um, in us in a different way it also it also eliminates a kind of inner judgment and self-criticism and all that kind of activation of the judging mind how do i compare to somebody else and am i progressing um i'm not the person that i should be uh, and it and it eliminates that whole sense of unworthiness to recognize that you already contain innately um what uh, can flower in you with your attention and your care I think now um, a nice lead in Kane would be for you to share with the audience this concept of having a daily self care practice. Um, I just published in Spirituality and Health Online um, some guidance that, that our viewers can look at um, from our uh, Facebook innate page. But what would be some, some tips of, of how that self-care practice could look like? That's a new concept for many people and how a daily self-care practice could impact one's, one's well-being and resilience. Yeah, um, the idea, and when we talk about self-care, we can, we can include everything that, that the whole body-mind experience um, encompasses. So, and again, it would be unique to each person but some of the main principles are just to take the idea of rhythm and continuity from the natural pattern. So the sun rises in the east every morning and uh, spring comes after winter and there's a sense of natural rhythm to, to the living world. And so in lieu of this forceful idea of discipline that we sort of force ourselves to do some sort of self-care every day, the idea is to be pulled forward with regularity. And the idea of the regularity in and of itself has a sense of supporting our innate resilience. And that resilience includes our ability to respond to our environment, for have our immune system balanced. Um, but in a sense, there's, there's a rhythm to it. Some people will find if they wake up in the morning and do some gentle movement exercises, some shaking, for example, or gentle qigong exercises or yoga postures every morning at around the same time, that that rhythm helps put them into harmony with the greater biorhythms of the living world so that their appetites, their hunger, um, their, the movement of the bowels, their respiratory rhythms, their heart rhythms, they all sort of harmonize with the greater, the greater living system of nature through practicing continuity. So continuity is always seen as sort of the main, the main principle. Basically do a little bit every day. Some movement and some stillness would be, would be sort of the traditional recommendation. So something in stillness, meditative, it could be standing or seated or lying down. In yoga, that may be a shavasana posture or a seated meditation posture. Um, moving, moving practices for the joints to help harmonize the flow of blood and the breath. Um, and then some sort of self-massage or self-touch aspect to the self-care practice is also something that we see in um, Indian yogic practices, Tibetan yoga practices, and Chinese Qigong practices. And the focus of those is to 
calm the nervous system is to create the most basic, basic sense of safety through touch, which we get from our caretakers, from our mother, you know, as, as we're born, that sense of being held. So to create that feeling every day, just a little bit through self-touch or self-massage, um, and then some gentle movement, and then some practice in stillness, that would be, that could be a 10 minute, you know, little set or expand it out to an hour. Um, but the idea of this, that 10 minutes a day is actually has more continuity value than an hour once a week or something like that. Um, and again, we're always recommended to go with what's simple, to stay with the basic, basic principles and not to make it too complicated. Um, and again, that we would adjust based on the seasons and based on our, on our age or our phase of life. Um, okay. Okay. Um I mean, you, you brought up the, the concept of, of safety, and I wanted to definitely touch on this um, pervasive feeling of fear, that there's so much individual and collective fear. And one of my concerns is the sense that fear weakens our immunity, makes us more vulnerable to infection and prolonged recovery. Um, Jack, from, from a Buddhist perspective, how do we work with this difficult emotion of fear? Well, let me build on what Cain was saying, because I found in working with you, Cain, when you taught me some breath practices and some practices of activating some of the core energy points within my body to, to build that energy, like access to that inner energy, um, you also gave me um, practices of bringing, after creating a field of warmth and energy or chi or prana, of bringing that energy to touch my body in, in different ways. Um, and one of the things that I learned from you that was so helpful, I was sort of doing it as a massage. Okay, work the muscles and things. You said, you said no, 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 no. This is a really about energy. It's about the, that part of your body receiving um, the attention and the energetic connection that wakes up that inner energy and connection. And that was a whole very different way of touching and holding and bringing attention to the body. Mm -hmm. So now to build on that um, and be very practical as you are, I find that when I sit in meditation at the end of the day, I've been online teaching, broadcasting, communicating with people, doing all the kind of things one does. Um, when I sit quietly, there's a well of feelings and uh, um, thoughts that are below my normal consciousness so that when I check in as I would with my body and I can feel the tension from fight, flight, or freeze that I'm not even aware of, but I get it from the news and the anxious people who ask questions when Trudy and I are teaching online or, and so forth, that it accumulates. My body goes into, okay, wary, how do we fix this? How do we, uh, which is the collective anxiety we have now it's now also turning toward our collective grief, actually. That's kind of the emotional arc, I think, that we're in. And so when I sit quietly um, and I direct my attention first to my body, I can feel the things inwardly that I had been not so conscious of. And with them, I can sweep through my body and begin to release them or invite them to drain into the earth or give space for them to open and move so that that energy field that's bound can then release itself, which it does when you make space. And then I go to my heart and my mind and I realize there's more grief or there's more sadness or there's more anger or fear or all those things, anxiety that, um, that I wasn't so aware of. And the movement, just as Cain has described, bringing a, a loving attention to the energy of the body is to bring a loving awareness, a loving attention to the feelings of the heart. And so when there's fear or anxiety or grief, as if to bow to it, I can name it gently, oh, this is fear. This is 
anxious. This is uh, sadness, tears, grief. And then as I name it, I invite it to open. All right, show me how big you are. Fill my body, fill the room. So I make space for it to be held with that same kindness of the, I'm calling it mindful, loving awareness and allow it to open. And if you allow things to open, things that were frightened or difficult, they might even get more intense for a while. Eventually they soften and they open to space and then you realize that you are the space, the awareness that's holding it. Then I recommend, then you bring in compassion and hold it all. And you can even say, thank you for trying to protect me. I'm okay for now. I'm actually all right as I am. And the fight, flight, or freeze, all those emotions and so forth, they settle down when you thank them. They say, okay, I've done my job, thank you. And then you can start to rest in a place of stillness, as you suggested, Cain that is the stillness of awareness itself, of consciousness, which is what we really are. We're conscious hearing and moving and seeing each other. What we are is that consciousness itself. So we're talking now together about both the physical well-being and the well-being of the heart and mind and how the, 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 how the approach in some ways um, of trusting what wants to open and then trusting that the heart is big enough to have the space and the mind fast enough to hold it all um, and become, come back to a place of balance and peace. Thank you. Kane, what could you add to, to that? And, and in particular, um, articulate more about, about this concept of, of safety. Yeah, I mean, the, everything that Jack shared is exactly the, the framework, you know, whether, like Jack said, if we're relating to an emotion or a thought or a sensation and this, this, you know, sensitive and, and um, present way of being with our physical touch. Um, as, as young people, when we're first born into the world, one of the experiences that settles our nervous system and in a way gives us our reference point is the experience of being placed on our mother's breast and listening to her heartbeat and we can actually we can actually experience that whether it's you know like jack was saying at the end of the day we we're aware that we've we've done a lot in our day we've taken in a lot of information our peripheral nervous system is engaged with a lot of material and there's in a way a buildup of, of experiences for a newborn we've been in our prenatal state surrounded by fluid in a way held by the mother literally within the womb and then we're born and then all of a sudden our peripheral nerves are, are awake, we hear, and maybe we see fuzzy, but we, we smell. And so to settle and find safety is to find that contact point. And so with the physical self-care aspect, as well as with the stillness meditative aspect, part of the important aspect is to find the contact point where awareness allows the emotion to be felt where awareness allows the sensation to be experienced. And that same principle is applied where we find my hand is touching my arm. And I'm both aware as the one who's touching of the quality of my touch. And I'm aware of the one who's experiencing receiving the touch as the quality of the way that makes me feel that kind of touch. And so we can apply that principle to the way we move, the way we speak, um, and the way we touch ourselves and bring that understanding into self-care and that actually helps to calm the nervous system and create a sense of safety. So even though we might experience a strong sense of fear or strong powerful emotions like grief or anger, it's, we can completely embrace those even if we do feel afraid that that sensation or that emotion is going to kind of overtake us we can work with it as awareness and we have a way of working with it through the physicality by working with our nervous system and so you know for example we if we just make a simple movement of you know moving the hands up and down if i move the hands up and down in, in a kind of quick way that might create an agitation and if i move my hands up and down in a really smooth and and slow and relaxed way that can create a sense of calm 
and sensitivity at the level of the nervous system, which creates a physical sensation of safety, which reminds us as a physical animal body of the feeling of connection with the mother, the feeling of connection with earth. And so all of these are little ways that we can, we can practice, you know, at a, at a moment each, t- each day and at little moments through the day, remember to find a sense of safety, even while things feel uncertain. Um, and in that way, we're, we're not at odds with our, with our experience of feeling uncertain, it's fine. But we can feel a sense of safety within that uncertainty um, by telling the nervous system, hey, I'm present, hey, I'm here through simple self-touch or smooth and gentle movement. Thank you. Well, we'll make time at the end where, where you'll be able to teach our viewers some of the simple self-care. Okay, uh, sure. Touch practices. Um, I wanted to touch on this concept of acceptance. Um, in medicine, so often, there is this framework of fighting against disease, of, of wanting it to go away, of, of suppressing it. Yet in my practice of innate medicine, I found it pivotal to invite my patients to come from a place of deep acceptance of what is actually occurring in their, in their physical body. And by doing so, they're no longer in a stance of, of resistance and they can act from a place of creative response. And I wonder, Jack, from a meditation perspective, how can we apply this concept of radical acceptance to the pandemic? Well, that's a deep question. Let me make it personal to start with for us individually. And then I want to again connect with and build on what you were saying, Kane. Um, In the heart practices such as loving kindness and compassion, practices of inner peace and so forth. The principle is to start where it's easy, to not make these things that, that will help us in, in build our innate capacity, to not make them into a grim duty that you have to, you know, I've jogged and I, you know, worked online with my trainer and I'm on a diet. It's not that. I, and um, I love what Voltaire said, I'm sure you know it well, Josefa, that the real work of the physician is to amuse the patient while nature does the healing, that there's some in, innate and deep trust in, in, in well-being. So that what happens in working with um, the difficult states, and we can't really separate in and out, or that the virus isn't just out there attacking us, It's part of the web of life. It's part of us somehow in some way. It's part of humanity at this point. Um, uh, There's a practice called RAIN, which is to recognize what's true, to see it clearly. And then that's recognition. And then to accept it. This is true. If you don't accept that the virus is there and so forth, you can't respond to it. You don't accept that, uh, you know, um, the seas are rising or that the, the atmosphere has more CO2 in it, you can't respond in any useful way. So you have to recognize and then accept. And the acceptance in both of those means that you have to also acknowledge the, your, your fears, your, your resistance and so forth and say, yes, but this is actually, I can bear this. It's called expanding the window of tolerance to be able to hold the reality of our life with a big heart and the trust that we can. Then the next step is to inquire or investigate to see, well, what is this? You know, which is to bring an open mind to it and say, well, what do I or what does humanity have to learn from this virus? And without saying, you know, what should be or what it's, you know, laying some philosophy on it, we have some big things to learn from this. And it is teaching us about interdependence, about self-care, about the, um, the different difference between the rich and the poor and the haves and the have-nots and the fractures in the society, and also how we care for our neighbors as well as our own body. So to recognize, to accept with all the emotions that come with it, to actually inquire, well, what do I have to learn from this? And then end 
is to nurture, to not so be so identified with your position of how it should be, but in some way to say, right, this is an invitation to hold it all with compassion and nurturance. And then perhaps to step off of whatever you're paying attention to, to the bigger picture um, and say yes for um, thousands of years and generations, there have been epidemics, there have been floods, there have been tornadoes, there have been all of these things. And we as human beings know how to survive. It's in our genes, our ancestors survived all this. That's why we're here. And we're part of this web of life that's recreating itself in response to other parts of it. And we know how to do this and it can make us actually kinder, more connected, loving, stronger in our own bodies and in our communities of humanity itself. So that process of acceptance isn't just, oh, I accept it, but actually it's a way of understanding and working with it. Yeah. Can, can you add to the conversation on, on acceptance and the pandemic? Yeah, it's beautiful what um, Hal Jack shared with it. Um, I think the, the, the pr bringing those principles to how we hold to this idea of continuity where, where things, where our schedules have shifted, kids are home from school, lots of people are home from school um, or home from work, um, college kids have in many schools throughout the country been sent home and so in a way there's this beautiful moment where we're returning back to this ancestral wisdom and this ancestral way that has been there since beginningless time of, of a kind of closeness, vivid closeness with life itself, which brings us into contact with the possibility of dying, the possibility of illness, um, bringing families closer together and spending more time together. And so I think one of these ideas of the rhythm, the natural rhythm, um, it's really important to have a have a respect for and to be able to cultivate that at, at the micro level that would be Okay, so I don't have a commute anymore to work, for example, but I can still get up at the same time still have breakfast at the same time. Do some movement practice at the same time and do some work at around the same time. The kids maybe aren't going to school. Um, but we can still do homeschooling at around the same time have a recess of physical exercise that the family does together at around the same time. And then for the family to eat lunch together at around the same time that the kids would be eating at school. And so all of these can be in a way returning back to the way human family has operated for so long, especially before the industrial revolution, um, much more responsive to the larger cycles of time, of solar time through the day and seasonal time through the months um, as, a, as a family unit, as a community, and as a global family. And so those, those tie into the simple idea of th that's actually self-care. Self-care of having a schedule and a routine um, ripples out into the family unit. Well, first it ripples out into the unit of the two you know, or more caretakers that are caring for the larger family unit and then out into the kids. Um, and so what I've, what I've been doing myself and encouraging um, students and clients to do is to um, is to collectively decide upon a schedule, a rhythm based on what works best for the whole family unit and to respond in that way, um, focusing like you're saying on, on the host, first on one's body and then on the caretaker unit and then on the whole family unit. And in that way, we're cultivating the well-being of the host and we're being in harmony with the greater living tissue of life of which this corona novel coronavirus is a part. And in that way, we don't fall into the tendency to, to kind of allow that hysterical notion of needing to fight it and kill it and polarize with it to, to have a greater impact on us than it needs to have. We can still stay informed without going into that polarization, which you know we could elaborate on this fundamental dualistic fixation of snapping into this kind of island of self and getting into a protective, closed, isolated sense and polarizing with others, especially a, a novel virus as the other or as the enemy, it causes us so much 
suffering at the level of the heart and at the level of the body, at the level of the family. And so just very, very simple uh, ways of keeping us in a state of connectivity and in a state of, of relatedness with the, with the whole changing environment um, can begin with our daily routine and the way we engage with our families and our loved ones. And for many of us, that has meant that we're engaging with people who we might usually see more frequently in the physical and be able to hug and touch those people. And now we're talking to them on the phone or, or FaceTiming or Zooming with them. Um, but having some sense of, of, of schedule, of on time, and um, just non-digital family time can really play into the sense of cultivating harmony at the physical and familial and community levels. Okay, thank you. Well, um, Joe, Josefa, yeah. among your patients, do you have patients with uh, coronavirus? And how is that going? Um, so far, I, I may have had some um, patients earlier on. Um, they were both young and, and got exposed um, in a healthcare setting. Uh, but we weren't able to get the, um, we tried to do the testing, but that wasn't able to be confirmed. So we don't, we don't know they've recovered. Um, and as you know, I have discussions with, with my other patients and, and really having some tender discussions that very interestingly, we wouldn't have normally had um, for someone who's 70 and otherwise healthy talking about would they, would they not want to be intubated, you know, just really um, fleshing that out. But I feel that it's really healthy to, to talk about it and to, and to face, face mortality and, and really understand what, what is wanted um, and how in any situation, including being with, with severe lung disease and potentially needing life support, is that, is that actually what, what, what that person wants or, or wishes for? Um, and I feel those discussions have, have gone really well. They've been very tender. And there is a, um, there's a, a, I want to say esprit de corps, there's, there's, there's a vitality that I'm seeing um, in my patients. Um, even in the face of fear and uncertainty, but there's an aliveness that's that's coming forth as they have these discussions and, and deal with the new reality. You also suggested, I think, to me, it felt very empowering that not only to be sequestered, because Trudy and I both are at home and in our 70s, <clears throat> but even if we got sick, to stay at home as long as possible. Um, to ride through it in some way, whether it's the fever to let the fever burn through us or to take care of ourselves in the ways that we can, rather than think we have to go to the emergency medical system, but in fact that there are ways that we can, if it's necessary, live through the cycle of this illness with a more trust in our own bodies and their innate capacities. Yeah, I... I definitely am prepared if the hospital systems become overwhelmed to provide a lot of care uh, within my patient's home if, if they just don't even have access to the hospital, if it's not an option. Um, and there's this, you know, very wise action that, that I'm trying to educate my patients into trusting their bodies, but also knowing when they need to reach out. And you know, then I can guide them with that through being able to check their vital signs, and you know, knowing how well they're they're oxygenating with a pulse oximeter and blood pressure readings, but but how they're feeling, and and so we want to we want to access the health system when necessary if it's available, but we also want to build trust in our in our own body and not not go straight into fear but the trust that, okay, I'm ill, my, my body can handle this, let my body's innate healing mechanism um, come, come full, full online with, with what's happening. Thank you. 
Um, and I love that leads into this concept. And I, I don't, um, if you're willing to share, Jack, when you were much younger and you were a monk in Southeast Asia and you had some very severe tropical illnesses, what was that like for you without any comforts of the West to, to be with such severe illness? <clears throat> well, I had <coughs> typhoid fever and I had malaria and I think of having malaria and being in my little wooden hut in the jungle in Thailand in this forest monastery, <coughs> being really sick with a fever and just wretched. And my teacher coming in, looking at me and he said, um, the, and in the Lao language, which was the current, the language where we lived, it, it's very simple. He said, um, Kai, uh, which means got a fever, huh? I said, yeah. He said, sick, huh? I said, yeah. He said, suffering a lot, right? <laughs> I said, yeah. Then a big smile came on his face. He said, you want to go home and see your mother, right? I said, yes. <laughs> and then he laughed. He said, we have lived in the forest, in the jungles. We've all had this jungle fever. We've had malaria. Um, and it's hard. It's very difficult. And you know how to do it. Our bodies know how. We can do this. He said, now we have some medicines, and I will send the medicine monk over to give you some of what we have for anti-malarials. He said, but take this as your practice. We know how to do this. We know how to be with the heat of the fever. We know how to be with fear. We know how to hold all of this as a practice of both steady heart, awareness, um, and a deep trust that we can heal from this. Um, so, um, you know, uh, you're, now you're one of us. You've been through this and, you know, go forward and, and you, you'll be, you'll, you know, you'll get through this basically. And it was so important somehow First of all, to have a sense of humor about it, to go home to your mother and he was sort of teasing me, you feel like you're gonna die. And he says, yeah, well, maybe you think you're gonna die, but that's, that's just a thought you have. And then it was so reassuring to say, we as human beings have been through things like this and we can do it. Thank you, that's really beautiful. Um, can, can you share your, your perspective of, of being with, with difficult illness? Yeah, I mean, you and I talk, we both, wonder whether I had already had COVID-19 about six weeks ago. I mean, I, I got really sick when I was studying in India. Um, and, but this more recent experience was, was something different because I was home and, and the Corona pandemic had just started and I was wondering if maybe I had it and didn't know. Um, but the fever came on really, really strong. And like Jack was saying, what I learned from my mother and all of my teachers was to have this deep respect for for the fire element and for the fever and to sort of and to go Agni Deva, thank you, Namaskar, <laughs> bow to it and and in a way take refuge in the fire. And without being negligent, I called you and said, you know, my fever is about 101, 102, it's not breaking and it's going on for two days. Should I be worried? And you know, no, and, and kind of know, okay, my body has this intelligence. I don't feel I'm being negligent, so I'm gonna just curl up and and be and be with the fire and take refuge in it. And I think I was telling you in another conversation that there's a sense of, of course, I was in intense discomfort. I mean, the body aches were so bad that I couldn't get out of bed. I was curled up into a ball in bed for two days. But within that, there was a kind of enjoyment. There was a kind of pleasure, even in the burning. Something was Dying might be too strong of a word, but something was dying. And, and as I allowed my heart, mind, and body to be open to the experience, there's something exquisite in it. And I, and, I, and I was sobbing at numerous times through those couple of days, just saying, thank you so much. You know, in a way, this experience gave me a, a perfectly valid reason to cancel life for the whole week. And just that was wonderful. <laughs> I just was, was completely valid and not having to you know, attend to anything. And just to be with that, to be with the illness, which I wouldn't even call it that, the intelligence of this transformative process, um, it felt extremely challenging and, and beautiful. And even at moments, I was shuddering from the pleasure 
of the of the heat in my body. Um, and the fir the first twenty or thirty six hours or so, I fasted. I just drank water. I just drank hot water. Um, and so it's another thing of, of sort of like taking it as a retreat and and letting my body just do what it knows how to do in the most uncomplicated way. Um, and you know, like I, like I've told you in other conversations, I don't I don't say that that's what everybody should do. But if if one has the training and can listen to their body and has the support, even the, listening to this conversation can be enough support from from Jack and, and Dr. Rengel and I um, to to open up to that possibility that the body can can actually run through its full complete course all the way to healing. And even beyond, after the process ran its full course, I actually felt quite different after. Something had changed in me. My ability to appreciate the little things expanded in some, in some way. Just, just, I remember the first day I got out of the bedroom and walked outside and saw the sun. I felt more grateful to the sunshine that I remember feeling. And so in a way that gift just kept, kept unfolding even after the illness was was complete in a way. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's this blend where um, we don't, again, shun conventional medicine. We have access to it. We reach out to our doctors if, if we're concerned, but we also trust in the body and, and we can bring both. We don't have to like choose b between them, but but you know that that's the beauty of, of of accessing all of our resources and and holding ourselves in our own wholeness. Um, let's see. Since we've touched on such beautiful deep concepts, I think I'm gonna uh, pose one more question, and then we'll have um, Kane teach us some some self soothing, and then open it up to questions. But I want to talk about the concept of, of impermanence, that everything arises and dissolves, and life is in a constant flux and dynamic. I know it's been really helpful when I reorient my patients through this lens of fluidity and offer them the, the concept, the notion of not concretizing their illness as something fixed, unmovable, unshakable, but that that there's fluidity in all of life, including disease presentation. Jack, what do you feel the teachings of impermanence, how that can inform, inform us in this time of pandemic? Mm. Well, I'm listening to you and I'm inspired by what you say. It's one of the central Buddhist teachings that all things are impermanent. They have the nature to arise and pass. When we understand this, and I think maybe understand is the wrong word. Um, when we inhabit this, when we allow this truth to become alive, and it's not far away, our thoughts are like a river, our emotions are like a little, little bigger waves on the river, our body, all we have to do is close our eyes and feel it as a living field of sensations and energy, never exactly the same. Um, and for shorthand, our brains are wired to make everything fixed. I know who you are. You're Dr. Josefa. You know, you've got your Stanford training. You haven't yet torn up your MD degree to say I'm doing innate medicine and I don't care about that. But on the other side, you also say, I really trust something that's different than the kind of rigid metal, medical model that's so much a battle against things. And you're holding this beautiful kind of and this beautiful sense of um, the fluidity and the natural organism of life itself and tending it. We need to feel that in ourselves, not as a concept. But, and to get it, you're reminding patients that illness is actually a river that you're going to go down. It's an adventure. It's a process that you're in. It's flowing. It has movement. It's enormously helpful. And everything else that matters to us is the same. The way we raise our children or how we travel or how we build our work. It is all actually a flow 
which is of course the essence of the Tao as well, um, not as an idea, but underneath it, when we get quiet, what's needed is not just a recognition, but married to it is a deep sense of trust that we do, that we are, you know, carried by the river of life or I love that Ojibwe native saying where it's, uh, sometimes I go about pitying myself when all the while I'm being carried by great winds across the sky and somehow we're being carried by the, by the river of life. And when we can trust that, then we can act, we can respond, we can do things, but we're not in charge of the world. We're rather responding to the currents as they change and the, the big waves or the calm places and say, oh yeah, this too. Thank you. So beautiful. Hey, Ken, I'd love your, your input also on, on the permanence. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I'll just I'll just share a story about the physical the physical part um, that relates to yogic teachings. One of the one of the key practices in the in all the yogic traditions, Buddhist, Taoist, and Indian yogic, is is thinking about contemplating one's own the impermanence of the physical body. It's, it's called dying before you die, right? And so we can do that. And there's so many beautiful teachings on how we can apply that through, through our direct experience. But there's two that, that come to mind that I think about and practice every day. One of them is in, in all of our self-touching practices. One of the levels that we're aware of is that as we gently touch our body, we're aware that by doing that, numerous cells from the exterior have now fallen off. And that part of what I think of as my body has now shown what it actually is, which is just elemental constituent parts temporarily arising in this particular appearance that I call my body. But it's never my body because I can't actually hold it together. It's always just sort of staying together of its own nature for as long as it does. And it's also at the same time, it's falling apart while it's staying together. And so this, it's a wonderful resolution of paradox in a way that my arm is still there, even though I rub it. But I am aware that as I rub it, some of the cells will be, will be exfoliated off. And as I let those go and feel that releasing, I'm aware of dying before I die. So part of self-care is actually appreciating dying or impermanence or the falling apart of, of appearances as intrinsically connected with nourishing them and nurturing them. And then that way we're not at odds with impermanence, we're not at odds with death. We're actually cultivating the whole process of life of which arising and enduring and dissolving are, are inseparable parts. And so I'm aware of that level when I rub, when I rub my arm. And I'm also aware of that level at the macro when I practice, I have, I rely upon the ground, both sort of cosmically as the ground of awareness. And I also rely upon the literal ground of the earth to do a posture or to do a movement exercise, or even to set my meditation cushion down to do seat, sitting. And so in that way, I think about the earth and I think about, oh wow, the continuity and the solidity. And then like I do with my physical body, I pan out in time. And I imagine the time when our sun goes through its life cycle and it also dissolves or dies. And that process causes the earth to get really cold. Or if our, if our sun goes supernova, maybe explodes our earth. And I imagine the time when literally our earth, the constituent elemental parts upon which I rely to stand and sit, those actually fall apart. They are also impermanent. And, and it's in that way, both my micro body and my macro body of the earth, I run through that experience and I feel, am I, am I in harmony with that truth? Because that truth is the reality of the ground of existence, or am I resistant? And in that way, I can have a very personal and physical and, and earthly 
relationship with impermanence. Um, and, I, and I practice that a little bit each day connected to my body because my mind would love to just go into the conceptual idea of impermanence and think of it as a nice idea, but not really have to experience the reality of that because it's a bit scary. Um, so those are two ways that, um, that I use that in the physical self-care practices. Thank you. So could you teach us a really brief um, self-care yeah. practice and then we can move into a couple questions. Yeah, so let's do this part that Jack was, was talking about that we practiced together of rubbing the palms together. So as we rub our hands together, the idea is to sensitize the palms of our hands with smiling, loving awareness. Um, putting our heart in our hands, we could think of. And as you create a little bit of friction, some heat will arise there in the hands. And then if we just hold the hands together for a second and feel that warmth, and then separate them slowly and still feel that there's some kind of connectivity there, some kind of warmth. And then let's bring that over the eyes and just rest the palms over the eyes and feel that we're smiling through our hands into our eyes, into our brain. And then slowly moving the palms up over the forehead and start to come over the scalp, the hair, and around the back of the head, and then very gently around the neck, and as we lift the chin to come under the jaw, where our lymph nodes are under our jaw, and our fingertips will start to come together right in front of our thyroid, in front of our voice box, and our hands are back into prayer. And then we let them slide down the sternum just a little bit, touching the sternum, and we finish in front of the thymus gland, the child's heart. So this is the inhale. We breathe in, the hands come up over the face, over the head, around the neck, under the throat, and then down the sternum. And touch with great sensitivity, with great care. This is our inhale. We come over the face, breathing in, As the hands come around the neck and under the chin and toward the throat, we start our exhale. We can exhale with a little bit of sound. Hmm. A couple more times, inhaling up over the face. And exhaling. Hmm. Let's do one more, inhaling over the face touching with sensitivity, with smiling, loving hands. And exhaling. Good, so the hands resting over the sternum of the child heart. Then let's finish with a waterfall down from the mouth, down the front of the body. And this mimics the process of eating particularly suckling and receiving breast milk down the mouth, through the throat, through the chest and into the belly. As we do it a few more times, we can use that sound. Hmm. Hmm. And with the last round, we finish with the hands over the lower belly. And with the eyes closed for a moment, smiling within, feeling that warmth from the mouth down to the belly, resting inside of our body with safety, allowing there to be space for the total experience all of the thoughts, emotions, sensations, 
the personal experience, the collective experience, all of it held as we abide anchored deep inside the body, allowing awareness to be open to the totality of our experience with boundless, radiant, loving awareness. Anchored deep, deep in the body, deep, deep in the belly. Good, and then letting the eyes slowly fall open. Thank you, Kane. It is, it is noon, it's been an hour, it's been a really delightful conversation. I hope um, our audience has enjoyed it as much as I have. Thank you so much on behalf of all of medicine for infusing um, us with your, with your wisdom. Um, we, we are a collective and, and to have all of our knowledge, both inner and outer, here um, together for all of humanity is, is what we need to do. Thanks, Will really. you post this on your website? Yeah, we will definitely post it on our website. You'll be able to access it through there. It might be on YouTube and yeah, Facebook. Definitely. Let me see. Oh, I see people are posting. Yeah, I mean, can you want to just touch on on the on needing to wash hands? I know you said that in the video, but before we do the oh, thing, practice, yeah, I guess we've all joked about that when we've all been together, our hands clean. So, yes, of course, you know that this self touch is is so powerful. Obviously, we're all we're all practicing good hygiene, mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical hygiene during this time. So, of course, you know wash the hands for a minute or so with warm water, soapy water. And we've all heard the importance of washing every part of the hand as a sort of disinfecting process. I like to think about washing every part of my hands so every part of my hand gets love. So washing our hands really well and drying our hands would be like bathing or lighting incense or doing our chant before, before meditation. It's another it's, it can be included as another aspect of our practice. And that's how I like to think of it. I do it before each meal, but now of course, before we do our you know, face and, and self-care practices, washing the hands, see the water as, as this crystal clear, nourishing, loving, and it's washing away whatever it is that gets in the way of our intrinsic wholeness at every level. Um, so we can be in harmony with ourselves and with all of life and then doing the practices. So yes, I don't recommend doing them, you know, in public per se during this time, but certainly at home after a good hand wash is totally safe and recommended. Okay. Um, the last question that someone posed is the question about cytokine storm and, and potentially what would, what would be our view from, an, from a wisdom perspective on cytokine storm? I'll just, it briefly add from my perspective as a medical doctor, um, I'm definitely, and, and Jack knows this, but I've been orienting my patients away from, from heavy supplementation, from manipulating the, the anti-inflammatory components and also the immune stimulating components. And, before COVID-19, we, we would use a lot of supplements, I'm saying collectively within medicine, especially integrative um, functional medicine to either pose an anti-inflammatory uh, cascade or to immune stimulate. And, and people always talking about how can I boost my immune system? And I've just have expressed to my patients exercise caution. Like we, we just don't know and there's enough reason to think that it's not a wise thing to be manipulating um, our immune system in either direction. And 
and really coming more to to harmony and this is again where i lean on the ancient self-healing traditions that have a much more gentler approach to harmonizing uh the immune system than than something like a like a supplement or pharmaceutical Kane, do you want to add something to that i just want to say that it, i really appreciate that you hold that approach i think it's um it's amazingly balanced to be able to to embrace the need for supplementation or the use of medication or, or really any modality or intervention and to hold it all with caution um, that that we don't want to overwhelm or or do anything that could be invasive or difficult for the body to, to have to process or digest um, so yeah, I mean, it goes back to what Jack was saying before about any of these practices. It's like not making it like, like a chore or making it something that we impose upon ourselves. that's like with great difficulty, we add some pressure to ourselves. I think that that principle applies on the meditation cushion, on the yoga mat, and it, it applies as we go into what we eat and what, and what kind of supplementation we use. Um, so I think that there's a simple and elegant way of of utilizing what it is that we need to help support our best functioning at every level. But I think exercising some caution with overdoing it is really, is really wise. Um, I mean, I'll just finish it. The reason why that that's, that that principle exists in both Chinese medicine and, and the yogic Ayurvedic traditions is because there's this idea that the digestive fire has to process, it has to, it has to break down, digest, assimilate, and eliminate everything that we take in. And so if we take in a lot of what we don't need, we still have to process and assimilate that. So it puts pressure on the digestive fire, and then that can cause an immune response just in and of itself. So kind of like we, talk, we both talked about when being sick, you know, respecting and honoring the fever, respect and honoring the fire as digestion, is, has another application, which is to be careful with what we put into our body, including, you know, so-called good, good supplements. Just um, being, being selective about that, I think, is really um, an important part of honoring our body. Thank you. Well, we are out of time. Thank you all for joining us. I know Kane and I are, are planning to continue these um, online dialogues, um, and. A, Deep gratitude to Jack for your generosity, your time, and your wisdom. Great pleasure. It's great Thank to you very much. Jack and Jose. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for, for joining us, and we'll be in touch.